Yeah, yeah. All right, if you could take your seats, we'll get started here. All right, all right. Yeah. yeah. Well, good morning. Like I said, I'm Pastor uh, Ethan Michael. And I'm filling in for Ben Myers today. Uh, Pastor Ben just not feeling well, like I just said earlier, so continue to pray for them. And, uh, you know, as we go through this, uh, this message, if you couldn't tell, this is all, this is all Ben's work. He's a, <laughs> he's a picture guy, and I love it. And so it's going to be a lot of fun because it's going to be helping me with illustrations and, and uh, helping me kind of like trigger things in my, brains of, in my brain of what to talk about and everything. So it's wonderful. But uh, as we get going, we're, we're going to be talking about uh, jo- the story of Joseph and Mary and loving through the fog. As, they, as you know, they had kind of a crazy start to their, to their teenage years <laughs> that led to eternity for all of mankind, <laughs> for most of mankind. So that's, that's pretty amazing. And so we're going to look at how they loved well through, through that uncertainty and through the fog. But first, some family business, as we always do. Closing out uh, 2022, right? Um, what a fun time! Uh, we had uh, we had a lot of a lot of ups, lots of downs, a lot of changes, and it's just been really cool just to see how God's been been working through our body and, and all those different aspects. Um, and looking at December uh, kids program, thanking Stephanie for setting that up and, and getting us going. Uh, the slide that was another cool thing. It looked like a a lot of uh, a lot of things we haven't done in a while because of COVID stoppage and and trying to get back into it. 2022, we were able to kind of pick back up where we left off, so that was a lot of fun. And then the, the snow slide event was a lot of fun. And with that, sorry if I blinded somebody, I didn't mean to hit them with the, uh, I had the, um, the little pointer. But um, as I understand, as Jim Graham said, he will single-handedly break down the slide. So everybody, <laughs> just thank Jim Graham for that. <laughs> Appreciate you. It was really kind of you, brother. I'm even happier I said it out loud in front of everyone. Um, but then also, uh, we want to talk about giving. Uh, just an incredible job from everyone. And thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Um, you, look, it, ministry is just one of those things that it's a, physical, it's a physical thing we have to do. And with that, we need physical resources. And so thank you for your giving. Uh, we, we had a budget of, uh, I was thinking it was 338, and we ended up with 302, and we have, we're doing well. Uh, we got some money left over. We got some different incomes from different churches who are able to rent out, and so we're able to bless the, the local area because they're able to use this building. I mean, this, this building and this campus is absolutely incredible. That was just one of the things that, in coming here a couple months ago, I really realized, like, you don't get this in the middle of L.A. and the middle of Lamita and everything. Like, this is, this is amazing. And so we're going to use it to the glory of God. We're going to use it for the advancement of the kingdom. And what's wonderful, those churches are all, like, different languages and everything. So it's just, it's just God reaches out to every nation. It's so awesome and it's so wonderful. Now, looking forward to 23, and all the cool things that we're looking to is a lot of new community, right? New community, building up friendships, building up relationships in the body. And so I wanted to make a point on this um, because someone mentioned it, and so the only reason I'm going to bring it up. So kind of what what we're going to be doing for the men's uh, Bible study is just a men's Bible study on Wednesday and then for the Michael's small group thing on the Sunday on the 29th and going on. Uh, That that stuff, or at least for the the 29th or the... um, growth group. That's not to replace new community. We, we really want to push new community as the one that if you, if you can make only one thing for that week, pr- try to make that one. Um, but we also are trying to keep as many opportunities as we can for people to, to meet because sometimes people have to work on Tuesday or something like that happens. But as much as you can make it to the new community, we're trying to do that all together at one time and have these services. But I, I just think about how much we come together, how important it is because there's, there's two aspects to the body of Christ always coming together and meeting throughout the week, multiple times on the week. And I know it's difficult because we have busy lives, but there's two reasons why that's really important. It's first of all, holiness. Holiness is separated living from the world. And how do you do that? You live differently and you think differently. And then that gets to my second point in Romans 12, 1 and 2, renewing of the mind. How do you renew your mind? You do not renew your mind living in the world and socializing with the world. You renew your mind by living with the body of Christ and walking with Christians daily. 
And so that's my, that was my thought in trying to do, you know, Wednesday night Bible study and trying to do stuff on Sunday. As much as we can get, and then we don't want to be the ones always hosting things. It's, it's rather, you know, the body who can step out and do that. Why? So we can renew our mind to Christ and to who he is. And that's how we're going to have mature, healthy living in the body. And so that's something to kind of think about as we move forward throughout the entire year. Now, uh, another wonderful thing, uh, getting back into it, is the Women's uh, Desert Retreat on the 5th. So that's going to be awesome. And La Quinta. La Quinta. And then VBS, which is the big one. And during the, <laughs> That's such a big one. Uh, that's going to be a fun one for Stephanie to, to organize. But when we, as we're getting into that, we just want faithfulness in, in the congregation just to, to step up and step out to be able to help out in any way that we can because we're going to have hundreds of kids come in, and you know how crazy that can be. But we also know how fun that can be, and that can be, that's just going to be just a great time. So we're excited for that. All right, getting into love will find a way. I think this gets into the, oh, sorry, and this gets into the new community part. Yeah, we're going to be do, doing the 40 days of love, um, and, and this will, this will kind of cover, cover the attributes of God's love and, and detailing it and how it's applicable to us, and then in our sermons, we kind of look at it in a different aspect. Now, as we know, God's love is so special. It's so incredible. It's so deep. It's so wide. And it's amazing how through love we can face any kind of challenge, situation, obstacle, doesn't matter what it may be, but no matter what, Christ is preeminent and Christ's love is above all of it. And uh, love helps us deal with the fog and uncertainty of life. And getting into the fog and uncertainty, the, the illustration that he uses, that, that's being used here, is this idea of, have you ever been in a fog? <laughs> have you ever driven in a fog? We actually, Alex and I went to um, Arrowhead in November for like a little mini vacation. Hey, if you go in the winter, it's pretty cheap going up there. It's not too bad. But uh, we were going up there, and we just happened to be going in the morning, and my goodness, couldn't see five feet in front of me, and that's not an exaggeration. So now take the fog where you can't see as you're driving, you know, 30 miles per hour, but then throw on top of that a windy road, and then on a side of a mountain, <laughs> on the cliffs. <laughs> so that freaked us out, and, we, and at that moment, we we're, were pretty locked in on what was going on. And Ben, ben being an aviator, he talks about how this actually happened to him one time where he was flying, and his visibility was so poor. His visibility, he couldn't see anything in front of him. And what did he have to do? He, had, he, he, was, going to have to, he was going to have to trust on something outside of himself to be able to navigate through the fog. But what does, what, what does fog do? And, and, and kind of looking at, I don't know if in a military term, since you know military, I try to not get away from those, ter- those kind of uh, examples here and there, but... In the military sense, there's the thing called the fog of war, right? There's something that you plan for and you have an idea of what you're going to do as far as execution of a mission, but there's just variables you cannot predict. So that's the fog of war. You don't understand what's going to happen. Well, life is kind of like that where you just have things that you can plan and perfectly do and you just don't know how it's going to shape out because anybody can be a different variable of how it changes. It can cause you to lose orientation, you don't, know how to, you don't know how to level yourself, to use a plain example. You don't know how to level yourself and keep yourself on the straight, narrow path. Fog, cloud, fog really clouds your vision of where you need to go, and you don't know what to trust or have confidence in. And for the sake of Ben, a San Francisco motorist following a taillight in dense fog crashed into a car ahead of him when it suddenly stopped. Man who crashed said, why didn't, you let, why, didn't, uh, why didn't you let me know that you were going to stop? As he yelled in the mist. And out of the, out of the fog came a voice and said, why should I? I'm in my own garage. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just say you can be disoriented when you're, when you're in fog. And when you're in cloudiness of life, 
when you have a lot of uncertainty. You must, so understanding first of what, what life is like, you must deal with uncomfortable level of uncertainty on your journey. You think about COVID testing, but it was, it was just going through the whole COVID scenario, right? And we're having inflation, we're having all kinds of crazy things in life. Our finances are not what we thought they were in the, in the past. And there's medical setbacks, people getting sick, betrayal in, in relationships, so many different things. And then maybe... You know, it's difficult raising a family and raising kids, right? And then having the kids turn and, and not be obedient and not be following you well. All these things create uncertainty of where your life is going to be like. And you don't understand where to look, who to look to and where to look to. Now, uncertainty eventually it always produces two kinds of responses from people. And that's either fear because of the internal senses fail here, right? You don't, you don't have anything to gauge with. You don't understand where you're at. You don't know what tools to use to be able to guide you well out of this fear into certainty, or it's trust. And in this trust, you have to have outside guidance. For the car, for a car driving on the line in the fog, it's, it's white lines, signals, road signs, taillights if you can see them. And for a plane, it's, it's instruments, different instruments. It's the, uh, it's the orientation, it's the airspeed, it's the compass, it's the altimeter. It's all these different factors here that when you have no visibility in front of you, you can crash inside of a mount, uh, into a mountain. But if you got airspeed, if you got, um, if you got, um, the altimeter, so you got, uh, and then uh, I'm trying to think of the other one, but you have all your orientations, you're able to tell how far you are from the ground and everything, and you can, you can gauge, right, by using the gauges and figuring out in your life. So you use, these, you use these tools to help you, even though you don't know what's ahead, you have these tools to help you know what to do in your next steps. Now, there's a couple ways that we can respond in this. If, if, you're, if you're uncertain about things, we can respond emotionally when life doesn't make sense. We can just throw our hands up and just say, hey, wh what are we going to do about this? Well, I don't know. It's, it's not my fault. It's not my problem. Or maybe it is my fault and my problem, but I don't really care to deal with it or handle it. And you know what? What's the best thing to do? Let's sin more in it. <laughs> let's, do, let's do the more wrong thing. It's not a surprise that we crash and burn so many times, so often in our lives. But it's also no wonder that we're so filled with anxiety and fear constantly. Why? We trust ourselves. We trust ourselves. So what's the truth about your life? We do live in the world of uncertainty. Emotion-based living just brings fear. That is what has been built around us. Since the fall of man has turned into uncertainty, what used to be certain is now uncertainty. The variable is that sin. The variable is everything that nature that has been marred because of sin. And because of that, we also have sinful reactions. And we base our life on fear. But what's the alternative? The alternative is God. It's trusting God. He provides the right guidance through the uncertainty that, that's coming. It says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, you might say that I don't understand how that works, but Jesus provides a window into seeing how trusting him and loving him changes everything. So he's talking to his disciples, right? And he says to them, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. He didn't say, if you love me, think of me a lot. If you love me, you, know, you don't have to talk about me to the world. But as long as I'm, you know, in your heart or kind of on the side there, that's fine. No, Jesus said, if you want to show love for me, 
What do you do? You keep my commandments. You follow what his words describe for you to do in the circumstances of your life. What is this? So what, why is loving him well, is keeping his commandments? Because love in action is living out Jesus' teachings. Loving God is trusting God. They're one and the same. Keeping his commandments is how you're going to be gauged correctly in your life and how you live well. So in relationships, God, God's kind of love in action is how to overcome the uncertainty we'll face. As you can see, there's a pregnancy test there. And so you can kind of get it, you can kind of get it at what we're going to get at in a second. So what kind of love, what, uh, so what's that kind of love look like? Well, we have the story of Mary and Joseph, right? We have two people there who are facing low visibility situation. They don't understand what's about to, what's about to happen uh, in, their, in, their for, in their forward steps of their, lives, of their lives. But no matter what, love will find a way, right? Even though there's uncertainty through the fog. Uncertain, and then here, the first bullet, uncertainty threatened to end Joseph and Mary's marriage before it began. And Mary's story was complicated by an angel visit. So let's, we're going to look to Luke chapter 1 to kind of open the scene. Uh, do I have that? Yeah, there we go. Now, Luke 1, 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. And she was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. There's a promise of God working through this, this uh, perfect descendant all the way from David to Joseph to be Jesus. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this, oh, I'm sorry. But Mary asked the angel, how can this be? I am a virgin. Now that's quite the dilemma. She was about 14 years old, but she understood how pregnancy works. And so she's looking at this scared and, and confused, and like I said, confused and disturbed by the angel's presence of this, of this major announcement that was about to come to her. Well, what does she do with this? She's engaged to Joseph, now she's pregnant? Well, that doesn't look good. What are people going to say? What are the, what's, the, what, what's Mary's village going to say? her mother and her father. That has to be kind of freaky. And the thing is, is that even though they were faithful, not everybody always is. So that when you're talking about the different variables in life, the thing is, it happens that you can go to somebody in your family and say, an angel came to me. Oh, <laughs> it's pretty likely that an angel came to you all of a sudden now that you're pregnant. <laughs> you, hope, you hope people to be faithful, but you don't know. You don't know how they're going to react. And we don't know, that's it's total speculation of how I'm saying that, but you don't know how people are, are going to react, but how do you react in faithfulness? Well, let's look at her, her response here. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Were you surprised by her answer? She wasn't new to believing in God, though. Uh, okay, that's the next one. We can be surprised by her answer, but she wasn't new to believing in God. This was a huge ask, but she responded well because she responded faithfully. Right now, that's Mary's side of it. <laughs> but it takes two to tango. We still have Joseph. And in Joseph's story, we see that clarity has complications. It has its complications. And in Matthew 1.18, it says... This is how Jesus, the Messiah, was born. 
His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. The first important piece I think is there is underline, Joseph was a righteous man. He was fair, he was loving, he was understanding of the situation, and he probably thought how disgraceful this is. At the time, he, the, the angel had not appeared, so he's, he's thinking, you know what, I, she obviously messed up, something happened, it's a lie, I don't know, I don't get it, but we're just gonna, we're gonna break, we're gonna break the engagement quietly, we'll divorce, and just, uh, she'll still have her honor to some degree, I'll still have my honor to some degree, but I just don't want to do this quietly. Because of his relationship with God, because of who he was as a righteous man, he dealt with it in a righteous way. But he still, he still didn't believe that it was necessarily this angel thing. We didn't have any idea. Yet God's faithfulness comes in. In verse 20, as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And Joseph, the angel says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. How can that be? That's never So even in Joseph being a righteous man, how much would he have understood the word in the Old Testament, right? Because that's all he had. And to know God, and then to hear something say, the Holy Spirit? A child conceived by the Holy Spirit? That's, that's radical. I've heard of Abraham. I've heard of Abraham and, and God was faithful with Sarah in, in, in having Isaac, but there was a, still a physical connection there. So how is, this, how is this possible? And again, for him, what's everyone going to say if I don't divorce her, right? That's going to look bad. Do I not take God's word seriously if everyone else sees it and says, oh, that looks like wickedness? And she was pregnant without them knowing each other. But Joseph was a good and godly man, and this was not his first day of believing God. Verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did it as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. There's that purity in it. Love and trust in God found a way. And because of their faithfulness, they got to see the greatest birth that ever happened on this entire earth. They didn't get divorced. They had the baby. We know, we, we know the whole story from there. So what does that teach us about uncertainty and intense experiences? Well, it shows us that they had a relationship with God. They had a relationship with God. They were surprised by the pregnancy, but the, and it put them to the test. So there's the relationship, right? There's the, there's the connection that we have, and you can kind of look at it in the sense of a believer. There's a relationship we have, but then we have the test, and, it's, and it, the test always seems cloudy, always seems foggy, but then we have the love and loving through the uncertainty to follow God's direction through the fog. They held on to the truth about God. They knew, uh, they, they held on to the commitment of their relationship. They had to figure that out. No matter what comes, at, it was kind of the... Or, it says that the no, no matter what comes aspect of a relationship, no matter what the case may be, we're still going to be faithful to each other, still faithful to God. And even if it was painful, even if it was hard to explain, even if they had to travel to deal with it, it didn't matter. Faithfulness, is to, faithfulness wins out. This is where love and uh, uh, sentimentality uh, parts way. The sentimental response says, Mary... You're, you're being asked to do too much. 
or Joseph, you have every right to let Mary go. See, we can find those excuses in ourselves to not love somebody and to not love perfectly. They always fall. But what was the love response? Mary loved God and responded in obedience to the situation she was being ushered into. Joseph loved God and his wife to be Mary. So he took the heat, Joseph being, he took the heat, stood up for her. He responded obediently to God's explanation given by the angel. And the baby was born with Joseph and Mary playing, playing in their, their hearts for, or you know, playing their forever parts for him. And I think about that as believers a little bit in this aspect of how many times would you like an angel to show up in your room besides just freaking you out, but show up in your room and then tell you, this is exactly how I, how I want you to walk and what I want you to do. I want to let you know that you have something greater than an angel inside of you. Do you understand that? You have the Holy Spirit of God inside of you. So before we have, and I, I thought about it for a second because I wanted to make a correction in my own head in case anybody was thinking about it. Yes, that'd be really nice if an angel told me to be faithful and to do things. A lot of, a lot of people in history heard, about an, heard angels and talked to angels and they still disobeyed. So that's a part of faithfulness. But at the same time, understand if you are a believer in Christ, if you walk with God, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And that is greater than any kind of visitation of an angel. I'm telling you, <laughs> that is not without question. And people still look for angels and visitations and stuff, and you have the Holy Spirit. You have everything that you need for Christ to reign in your life. Now, here's how love works. Let's define real love in uncertain times. Real love is following God's will or directions in the interactions you have. Like it was said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Okay, what, what's one of those ways? 1 Corinthians 13, 7, love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Looking back at Mary and Joseph's take, they never gave up. They never stopped to, to say woe was, woe was them because they were carrying God's child. They did not stop believing in God. They remained hopeful even in uncharted waters, and they endured through these never-before-encountered circumstances. But love finds a way, because it always does. Those who choose love as their operating style are always going to see, see God working in their lives. We follow God's design life and, and for his design for, our, for everyone's life and the believer. That's how real love is and how it operates. It's what, it's what is required of those who are in Christ. Love his way. He helps us as we need to. Love is surrender and it's complete surrendering. But the thing is, is that love is, is, emo is, is an action, is a motion. It's not emotion, it's motion. It's an action. Now, there's a feeling attached to it sometimes. Obviously, you can have sentimental feeling toward people, and, and, and within that, that can encompass love, but that's not exactly it. You can have a feeling all you want, but then you can turn around and hate that person by all of your actions and everything you do. But it's a choice. It's a choice to do what God instructs us to do. And that gets to couple of our final points. And what do we learn from Mary and Joseph's low visibility challenge? Your relationship with God determines your response. Both Mary and Joseph were God followers. For us, it's being in Christ. If you're not in Christ, you have no relationship with God. You just try to go through life trying to do whatever you can, figure in and out how you think it's going to work out best. And yet we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. We have the Word of God to lead us into all truth. And uh, I was thinking about it in this way. Understanding who you are 
in Christ is the most important part of understanding how to love perfectly and love well. Um, in Ephesians, I wanted to go to Ephesians 2, 10. Don't have it up there. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, work with me on this. What was Joseph called? He was called a righteous man. Now think of everybody in the Old Testament and history, the prophets, but let's go with a couple of the big ones. What was Noah called? He was called a righteous man. Who, what was Abraham called? He was called a righteous man. Sin was there, but they were called righteous because they were chosen by God. And they were used by God. So there's Noah, Abraham, Moses, same thing. Prophets, same thing. And now to Joseph. All right? What happened to you as a Christian and a believer in Christ? What, you came out of darkness into the kingdom of his son. What happened during that time? Righteousness was attributed to you by Jesus Christ. So therefore, since you are the righteousness of Christ, or righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, as 2 Corinthians says, what that means is, is you are now being called the person who is righteous. Why? Because of anything you've done? Absolutely not. All because of the work of Christ in you. And because of that, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Mary and Joseph were chosen by God to be used, and they were going to be faithful. Why? He was doing the good work in them because of, the, because of the righteousness that was on them. The righteousness that's on you, God has prepared good works for you. God has prepared his love for you to walk out in now through his love and how he acts it out through you to the world, to your family, to your friends, to, I don't know, co-workers. Let's say, let's just try to think of other people that annoy you. That was rude. I shouldn't have said that. I should not have said that. That was, that was, that was 100% flipping words, and I apologize. I apologize. Because I wouldn't, I wouldn't categorize that with the family and stuff. So I, I apologize. That's wrong. But these things have already been created for you to walk in. So what am I saying? I'm saying, think about it in the sense of your salvation, of where you're at. If you are walking in Christ, it's already prepared. It's already, it's already set for you to do that work for his name's sake. That's why that relationship with God, that, it means so much more than just, let me, let me put it this way, having a relationship with Christ, it means so much more than just saying like, hey, man, your life's going to be so much better, bro. Just, I'm telling you, this Jesus guy, he's got it, he's got it down. He's going to change your life and heart. It's not just that. It's so much more. It is so much more. You want, you want to live differently. It's only going to happen in the work of Christ. You want, to, you want to truly love somebody and love them well. It's going to happen because of the work of Christ in your heart. And that's where we come to, Right? We come to Jesus. Jesus left heaven, became the baby born to Mary and Joseph, God's son. He lived, led, and loved right, right before our eyes. He died on the cross, paid for our sins, rose on the third day, and he proved his power over death. And now he's seated at the right hand of the Father, in which he, when he's seated, he sent his Holy Spirit to live inside believers so that now we may be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We have to understand bowing the knee to Jesus, confessing our sin, embracing Jesus as our Lord and Savior, to follow him is, is how you have that relationship. But in having that relationship, that's how you get this love through fog. Not because it's often. I think it's harder all the time. And the reason why it's harder all the time, you love, true love, let me put it this way. Let me think of it. 
No greater love than this than the one who lays down his life for a friend. And part of that is in reference to Jesus, of course, laying his life down to his friends. And Jesus was saying, I call you my friend. That's why I'm laying down my life. I truly believe in the physical manifestation that if you died for somebody, physically died for somebody to save them, I truly believe that is true love, right? That's action. But then it's also dying to yourself daily. You wake up, you say, I will not live for my lust. I will not live for sin. I will not be a slave to sin anymore. I am a king, or I'm a son of the king. I'm going to live in Christ as a son, as a true follower of Jesus. And because of that, I am going to die to myself, and that's going to hurt. It's going to be painful. As much as, as much, I, I don't know how much the church, uh, uh, churches in general in the Western culture try to simplify things or at least make life easier in the Christian life. It is, this, it is a weird, uh, I don't know paradox is the word, but it's a weird conundrum of this idea where it's like, you die and it really hurts, but then it's also great because you, <laughs> you just feel incredible and free and your relationships grow and the people around you see the light of God working in you, but then it's also they get to see that and change their hearts and that love that comes out of you actually turns them back from them and they turn from their sins and they turn and treat everything differently in the, in, in the relationships and in, in every a- aspect of how you live. It's so incredible but it's still this piece of you having to die, and it's painful. It's sacrifice, but it's true love, and that's loving through an uncertain time that you don't know when your family will turn. You don't know. Your, your spouse might hate you. I hope, they're, I hope they don't if they're a believer for sure, but if they're an unbeliever. They're, your spouse might hate you. What does the word say? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives, respect your husbands. Do I respect my husband? It's a terrible way of saying that. If you're a woman and you... (laughs) As you can tell, I cannot preach off the cuff all the time. But if you're a woman and you have a husband, right? And doesn't treat you great. I'm not saying like abuse. I'm not saying extreme cases of things, but doesn't treat you very well. Not, not, not necessarily a godly man. Does it say respect him if he follows Christ and does it well? Doesn't. If you're a husband and to the wife, it says, doesn't say respect the wife. It says love the wife. There's differences. Men and women are different. We, we, we look for different things. It says love your wife. As Christ loves the church. In that, does it say, my wife does a great job with everything ever. She, oh, everything I ever ask, you know, it always works out, blah, 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 all this different stuff. No, what, what, if, she, what if she hated me? What if all these different problems? I'm supposed to love her. That's loving through uncertainty. Not knowing what the end is going to result to. But you still love all the same because Christ loved us first. And so, why is that important? Because real love never fails. It never gives up and never gives in. We do not turn back from it because we've been given all of it by Christ. The entire culmination of love has been summed up and placed inside of us by his Holy Spirit. What is the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But I would say those are actually explanations of the first part, and it's just fruit of the Holy Spirit's love in all of these things is joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Love never fails. Isn't that how you always want to respond? You want to respond perfectly? You want to respond well? not quitting, not giving into temptation and sin. Only one response gets you there. It's the love. It's the pure, unadulterated love of God. Never quits, never gets in. Like, like I was talking about earlier, who is love? God. And love what? Never fails. God never fails. Do we fail? We absolutely fail. But what do we need to do in doing that? Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do and he will, uh, he will show you which path to take. I always uh, think about that and trust with all of your hearts. Do not, do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do. In all you do. Have you ever done a math problem that was very difficult? <laughs> Coming out of college, when uh, in college, we, I had to take, um, I had to take, what was it? it was, uh, mechanical engineering, aeronautical engineering, and astronautical engineering. Okay? I'm not an engineer. <laughs> so that was very difficult for me, and my mind does not work that way. So it was very difficult. But I think about this for when you, when you struggle in wanting to love your child through a math problem or something. I think about this. Trust the Lord in it with all your heart. Okay, I trust the Lord in all my heart that I'm not going to strangle my kid because they can't figure this out. <laughs> seek his will in all you do. Okay, I'm going to seek his will that we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do a good job. No, no, no. Who is the Lord of math? Who's the Lord of English? Who's the Lord of literature? Who's the Lord of thought, of education? Christ is. And all we do, we do for his glory. And that is including in how we love, in love and uncertainty. We do everything. But in everything, you have to realize, and, and this is kind of how I'm kind of twisting this a little bit, because I think this is the last slide. Yeah, okay, so that's next week. So in trusting the Lord, I'll say this, how can we trust the Lord? What does, what does that look like? How can you truly just love somebody in a, in, even through the uncertainty, not knowing the end? I'll say this. You turn the uncertainty to certainty. And that seems contradictory, doesn't it? Because it's like, well, now you just told me that I have no idea what's going to happen in the beginning <laughs> as we go along in my life, and now you're telling me, I just, oh, that's easy. So just flip it to certainty. There you go. There's a switch. I'm trying to find I apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I had it written down and then I missed it, so I apologize. But this is the important piece of it. Is Romans, I think of it as Romans 8. So how do you actually trust God to turn certainty to uncertainty, or uncertainty to certainty? Romans 8, all things work for the good of those who love him. All things work for the good of those who love him. I would challenge you to define what uncertainty means. Uncertainty to us means we don't know what the end is because I can't control the end. I don't know if I'm going to crash into a mountain because I truly don't know if I'm going to crash into a mountain. But that's the trust in God. He works all things, and this goes back to Ephesians 2.10 where he says, he already, we are the workmanship in Christ Jesus to work the good works that he's already provided for us to walk in. So the provision is already there, and this is how, uh, this is how I kind of look into it. It's an idea of provision, all right? So now, usually when you talk about provision, we talk about material things, right? And uh, where I absolutely believe it's a good thing to, to pray and thank the Lord for, for, physical, for physical needs, and of course that's a good thing. Why? Matthew 6 talks about that all the time. Matthew 6 talks about that where, hey, look at the birds of the air. 
They, they, don't, they don't store food, but God always feeds them. Hey, look at these lilies in the, in the field. Uh, they, their glory is beautiful, but they're, they're going to burn tomorrow. And guess what God, God provides for them? How much more are you than these things to him, right? So there's that, there's that everyday kind of manifestation and, and, and physical provision that God has. But I would challenge you to also look at provision in a different mindset, he also provides you in the situation that you're going to go through to be the perfect situation that you're going to walk through that's going to have him be glorified the most. And because you are a son of God and in Christ Jesus and you're the righteousness of God, that means he's put you in the perfect position and place to walk out in love. So in every situation, there should never be a time of I am in complete uncertainty of what is going to be carried out. That's not true. I know exactly what to do. I know that I am going to love perfectly with the love of God in everything I do because I know at the end, it's going to lead to the goodness of God, but it's going to lead to the good of those who love them. It's going to lead to my good, it's going to lead to the, to the goodness for myself, yeah, sure, but it's also going to lead to goodness for everyone else because it's faithfulness in God, and anything that's faithfulness in God is always going to be carried out in holiness and righteousness, and it's going to be good for every man. So look at provision differently. Love never fails. Who's love? God is love. He never fails. Guess what he's not going to do? He's not going to fail working in you. Do you get that? And the, and, and the constant thing that always pops up and people freak out anytime you say, well, God works so much in you and he's going to do this and that and all this other stuff, and you talk about the Holy Spirit working inside of you and how he's given the Holy Spirit to work inside of you, people then say, well, there you go. I don't have to do anything ever. No, you're proving that the Holy Spirit's not inside of you by not doing anything. That's scarier. That's much scarier. But what does a good father do? In Proverbs, it talks about what does a good father do? He disciplines his child. Because if he didn't discipline us, and if he didn't give us what we need, doesn't, do you know what the, the verse says in Proverbs? A father hates his child if he doesn't discipline him. God loves us. That's why he disciplines us. That's why it hurts that's why it hurts when we die to ourselves. Why? Because he loves us. Because we can love others so much better by that. Think of provision differently. Think of provision differently. He's provided this for us already. Right relationship with him, that being righteous in him, makes life harder. And yet he never fails in all that. Amen. And then, then the next week I'll, I'll talk on uh, what unconditional love does. But yes, today, today, do not harden your heart as they did in the rebellion. As it says in the word, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, if the Holy Spirit is inclining to your heart to turn to him, do not harden your heart. This is not a self-help speech. This is not anything. This is not anything but a complete life change of Christ in you, the hope of glory. This loving through the fog means absolutely nothing if it doesn't mean to his glory. But we are going to be people of love through complete uncertainty into the world. And the world would define it as uncertainty. But we will define it as certainty because we know our Father will do all things to the good of those who love him, which is us. And who, who, is the, who, are, who are they that love him? The ones who keep his commandments. And this isn't, this isn't a law thing. I'm not getting into legalism, lawful stuff. What I'm getting into is it all works together. How do you become faithful? Because of his faithfulness. How is that shown? By walking the things that he's prepared before you. 
knowing that he will complete a good work in Philippians. It says he will complete a good work in which he started. He will see it to completion. So if you are in Christ, you truly do not have to worry. You don't have to fret. You, all you have to do is submit, surrender, die to yourself. And you say, Christ, I'm going to live for you. I'm going to do exactly what you prepared me to do. And guess what? When you fail, 1 John 2, 1. I got to tell Devin this one today. I was really happy about that. 1 John 2, 1. My little children, I write these things to you so that you will not sin. But if you do, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You see, even when you fail, and you will fail, even when you fail, his provision is still there. Because why? You're righteous in him. He doesn't pull that off of anybody. So you can look to him now and know that it is set. He loves you so much. Thank you, Lord. I'll close with a prayer. And then we'll close out for the day. Father God, thank you for your Thank you for your amazing grace and love. Lord, thank you that you love us with, a, with an incredible love that can't be compared to anything in this entire world. Lord, as we look at uncertainty in this life, and there's a lot of it, and we can go to the grand overarching world of so many things of uncertainty, but then we can even go all the way down to our, our little lives here and what we go through and what we, what we have trials and difficulties with, with family, with uh, relationships, um, with, with anything it might be, Lord, anything uh, that we deal with here. Let's remind us, Lord, remind us of the eternal things, the people most importantly, you. All those other things are, all those other physical things, you say yourself, they will all burn up. They're temporal. They're temporary. They don't have, they don't have eternal value in us. So Lord, let us seek what has eternity in us, which is you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto us. So Lord, we will we will look to you. Let your Holy Spirit work in us, Lord, as we faithfully hear and then walk this out in our lives. We love you and thank you and praise you in your great name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for kind of uh, working with me today. Sorry, there's, you saw some like silent moments. That's because I had no thought. And I was like, oh, okay, we're just going to push through. But. <laughs>